and welcome to Viewpoint. I'm joined today by Victoria Brinza, sociologist at, based in Lviv in, in West Ukraine. Uh, Victoria, many thanks for coming to join us. Hello, nice to be here. Um, we had uh, Joe Biden, the US Vice President, uh, here in Kiev uh, recently, and uh, he gave a speech to MPs in, in the parliament. And he was sort of... It was sort of a double-edged sword. On the, on the one side, he said, you know, yes, we support Ukraine and America stands behind you. Um, and that was all very nice. But on the other side, he said, actually, we need to see some more from Ukraine. We need more reforms. Um, he, he urged the MPs, saying, like, they have a historic moment now um, to, you know, to make a change for, for Ukraine and, and set it on, on the right path. Um, this is all coming, of course, two years, roughly, after the Euromaidan that we had here in Kiev, a big anti-government uh, protests. Um, your view is slightly different, uh, as I understand. I mean, Joe Biden wants to see some more concrete reforms. He, you know, he wants to mm -hmm. see energy markets opened up to competition, for example. Um, your view is different. Tell us a little bit about how you see things. Do so you believe there has been change <laughs> in this country? Let me give you some other perspective because I study the society. I see what uh, processes are going on in the society, how values change, how uh, beliefs change. So, um, of course, we need some more uh, efforts from the government, but these efforts will not come just only from the will of the government without the pressure, without the um, request from the society. And if we look at the society, what we see is that the, um, the majority still lives in the situation of threat. And this is not only external threat, this is a feeling that uh, rule of law is not working. And we see our government still as a threat and still uh, the institutional trust is very low. But what I see as changes, and those are rather um, qualitative than quantitative, we cannot count them in big numbers yet, but what I see, especially in Lviv, that um, there are some groups, some um, numbers of people, of uh, young people, who are not um, living in this mode of survival anymore. So they see they can... Um, uh, work with their brains. They they have uh, they are competitive globally, and they care about Ukraine and they want to stay here. So they really believe that democracy is worth uh, fighting for. And they... is this not? But we saw this, didn't we, two years ago? Mm -hmm. This is what the Euromaidan was. Was it? Was it not? It was the people rising up and saying, "Look, we've had enough of this. This corruption, um, this system that does not work. We we want change." So, is this? Is this different now? Have we seen something after two years that's actually changed? Yes, because it was a protest against something. And we saw as during the Maidan, people were, were reflecting on what we are fighting for. And this is the change, because we um, are growing up as a nation, as a political nation. And we want to know only not only what we're fighting with, but what we're fighting for. And this agenda is just emerging now. We, okay. uh, we, we, we started this reflection. It's like growing up. Yes. Uh, you, you got freedom, and now you are thinking about the responsibility for this freedom. And so they didn't, uh, in, we didn't necessarily know what to do with it yeah. at, at first. I mean, could we say then that actually what we had maybe in Euromaidan, we had a lot of words, we had a lot of rhetoric. We said we want the rule of law, we want uh, European values. But did we really know what those meant? <laughs> we did a survey on Maidan, during Maidan, and we were asking people, are you ready to fight for your rights in your everyday life? We gave the examples of like uh, calling to your politician and asking for changing some uh, laws and so uh, and other and people were not ready just because they don't know the mechanism yet they they lived the, the whole generation grew up in the situation where corruption is normal so you need to really learn other practices are the mechanism and then you you also reflect on why am i doing so and with this young generation you have the opportunity as a young person to reflect on those things also when you have a child, for example, and when you're explaining this child why we are doing this and why we are doing that. And in this, at, at that moment, at the stage, you're starting your own reflection, you're starting to changing your beliefs, to thinking on what you're doing this and trying to search for other mechanisms.
But this is, isn't this a bit of a chicken and egg situation, though? Because, I mean, we have individuals, yes, and we can say to them, look, you need to be the agents of change. You need to be the ones who make these conscious decisions that you don't want to live in this corrupt society anymore. You have to start acting in a different way. But how can they do that when, you know, daily, almost, they're confronted by a corrupt system? So how do they break out of that? If, and how do they not... I mean, if they just want to get by and they want to try to live their life, how can they try to live, as it were, in contradiction with the system? When it seems easier just to go, just to go along with it. I guess the answer to that question would be worse Nobel Prize, you know, like how to do that. Because you, you have uh, a lot of people that are dependent on the corruption, dependent on this corrupt system, and they are a part of it. Uh, but I think uh, the do key... You, do, you see that, do you see people then as they're, they're victims of the system? I mean, because people don't... You're assuming that people don't want to be corrupt. They don't want to live these corrupt lives. But what if they actually... What if they like it? <sighs> Um, well, you know, uh, I would not say they like it, but they are uh, they adjust it to the system. They they know how to survive in this situation. And when you change things, you need to you need time to adapt to change uh, the way you see things and way you act in this situation. So I guess they want changes, uh, but they um, we really not understand. We are not really realize what these changes bring. And um, starting this reflection, you see, well, you, you can uh, go down in the depression and understand it is so difficult. We need to rethink all the structures, all the systems of the, of the state, because our educational system, our uh, econ economy, they are all um, born in the USSR and they are all um, built as a totalitarian structure. So we need to really rethink, what, for example, what education is for, not to reproduce ideology, but to re develop uh, human capital, for example. And uh, do, do we need... Um, so, I mean, um, Ukraine needs, like, a, a uniquely Ukrainian solution for this. Where do we look for, for answers? Where does this come from? Do we just simply look at Poland, for example, and say, OK, mm -hmm. they've had a fairly successful post-communist transition, let's just... Do what they did. Or no, is that, that's no. Not gonna, is that not going to work? The Polish society is other is different from Ukrainian society. Uh, we have other history and other um, structure, social structure, ethnical structure, cultural structure, and we are not so united with uh, one confession, for example, as Poland was, and we didn't have the one united movement after the revolution. But we, um, I guess, we have some. We may develop some patterns for the former Soviet Union, for example, for the situation when the society um, lived for 20 or 30 years after the Soviet Union collapsed. So this is a um, long period when you as society get used to the, to the living in, the, in this uh, circumstances. But I guess we, we don't need our uh, own Ukrainian path, I believe, but we need just to rethink the path uh, out of totalitarian regime and to, the de to democracy. We need to rethink what democracy is. And when we have threats for liberalism, for example, and Euroscepticism uh, in, in Europe, we also need to develop our strong argu arguments why liberalism is, is uh, worth fighting for and why it is better away. <laughs> it, it almost seems like at the moment, actually, in that sense, Ukraine is actually kind of going against the prevailing trend in Europe mm -hmm. at the moment, which obviously makes the task in this country um, ever, ever more difficult. I, I mean, do you see that? Do you feel that? Like, when you look towards Europe now, what you see is, I mean, growing uh, support for the far right and for nationalist mm -hmm. parties. So that surely, that is, I mean, that could slow down the process for Ukraine, could it, could it not? Yeah, um, I guess uh, there is a risk. But we uh, at Maidan, and Maidan experience is very fresh. And at Maidan, we learned why violence is not the way. And we learned through experience and through very deep reflection uh, why peace is important and why uh, peaceful uh, fighting against uh, evil <laughs> is important and why it is so sustainable. And I guess um, this impression, this feeling is very fresh and we need to ref really reflect on it and to uh, keep it um, 
methodologize. <laughs> so we really need to uh, put it into some methodology and to rethink why it is important rationally, not only through emotions. Uh, and I guess then we can bring it to the education and we could bring it to the uh, jurisdiction and uh, justice. And then we can uh, really have it sustainable and institutionalized. Mm -hmm. All right, well, Victoria, many, many thanks for joining us. I'm afraid that's all we have time for, so we'll have to leave it there. But thank you very much for coming in. Thank you. You've been watching Viewpoint. I've been joined by Victoria Brinza, sociologist based in Lviv in West Ukraine. That's all we have time for today. Join us again next time.